Hey, what's up everybody? Video 44 coming at you with another video. Look, man, I don't know what's going on with the Lakers, but it looks even worse that the Bulls went into Clipper land and got just smoked. It was really, really bad. It was a firing squad, as the announcer said. Clippers uh, just, just put them boys down. I mean, eight threes for Nicholas Batum. I think Eric Gordon had like five of them. Uh, it, it was a lot of shooting going on. It makes it worse for us because obviously we don't want to lose to anybody, but we definitely don't want to lose to a team that the Clippers easily handled the night after. Now, granted, it is the night after. They had to play that back-to-back. -back. The thing about this is I know for a fact they're going to come back into their building saying, well, at least we beat the Lakers. We can come in there and probably do that again. Not only that, but we didn't get ourselves a center. So unless we're going to do that over the next several days, we're still going to have problems with Vucevic and Drummond. So I'm not loving the circumstances ahead of us. Um, just just in terms of, of how we're supposed to be approaching this game and bouncing back and all of that. Obviously, you like the fact that LeBron James is going to be on the floor. But we need to find ways of, of putting the rotations around him that could have could effectively defend this particular team that's what i'm trying to express it's not even about just working him back in we really found ourselves at a disadvantage against zach levine um and we would much rather not have to have played them yet again in this situation <laughs> now normally in situations like this given the fact that you're seeing the same team twice it's like oh, okay this is just a prelude to the playoffs but what we're trying to do is not have to face the play in and if we do, we at least want to be in the 7th or 8th position rather than the ninth or 10th, forcing ourselves to win two games to get into the playoffs. I'm a firm believer that if you're an older team, you want to stay out of that circumstance. And honestly, there are some other teams who are playing around us who are also, now when I say around us, I mean teams who are also fighting for positioning, who are also dropping games they have no business dropping. Now, I haven't checked the standings as, as of yet. Um... But I do know that the Clippers did get this particular matchup. <laughs> and uh, that puts them in a position to continue to rise and probably take that fifth or sixth spot if they're not already in it. Uh, so I, I'm, you know, looking at the Clippers and saying uh, if they can hit eight, get eight threes out of Nicholas Batum every night, they're going to win the championship for sure. So that's what I will say. If they're going to shoot 50% from behind the arc, 20 for 40, then uh, you just go ahead and send Larry O down the hall because that's exactly where it's going to be. Uh, I do not expect to see that again. But, um, yeah, Lakers, for, for us, we're going to have to find a way to, to score the ball against these guys. Um, looking at how they won the game, the Clippers won the game, I think it actually plays into – the idea that we need to have shooters on the floor. Now, does that mean more Malik Beasley for the Los Angeles Lakers? Of course it does. But does that mean he fits best for us on the floor defending them? No. Now, one thing I'm starting to understand, and, and I'm trying to just kind of segue out of this because I was listening to what some guys were saying earlier about uh, forwards particularly who can get things done on the offensive end but give up everything they do on the offensive end defensively or even give up more, unfortunately. And I'm just trying to, like, you know, brainstorm and try to figure out in my mind, not to say that we have any of those players. Like I said, I'm segueing out of that. But just how do you mask something like that? How do you get the most out of that player? If I'm to assume a player like Christian Wood is that kind of guy, how do I mask him? Now, like I said, I don't really think the Lakers even have that problem. Not particularly. We need to try to find some offense out of our defensive bigs, but not so much, you know, offensive. You know, it, that was more like a, a problem we had with um, Thomas Bryant. <laughs> that was his issue, you know. But for, for what we have right now, no, that's not necessarily the issue. But that's just me brainstorming. I think the best way to kind of hide a guy like that is to make sure the defensive players around him um, are able to, to to kind of help. And that's what we always say. You know, if I'm to consider that issue, 
I would I would say LeBron James could be that on some nights, but that's that's his choice. You can always find footage of LeBron James playing amazing defense, literally amazingly defense. But for whatever reason, um, he he doesn't he does not always throw show effort on the defensive end, and so you have to consider him as somebody like this as I'm describing it. He's not Christian Wood because at the end of the day. Uh, we would never disrespect LeBron James to say that his numbers aren't going to match in terms of his ability to get stops versus get offensive plays. But, you know, one of those situations uh, for the Los Angeles Lakers has to be, um, you know, one of the things that we have to co- be concerned with is how to help him defensively uh, in these situations, particularly when the players around him are athletic and can, you know, dart through the paint and all of this different stuff. I liked us much better when we had uh, our lineups that were in place <clears throat> against OKC against this particular Chicago team. And I would not be mad if we tried to simulate more of that and less of trying to incorporate Braun into the four. Because really that throws our entire roster out of whack. We just seem to be a bit more sturdy when AD and either Wing and Gabriel or AD and uh, Vanderbilt when he's playing well. I haven't seen a whole lot of good from Vanderbilt lately. Uh, so I, I kind of am reluctant to want to put him there. So I would want Braun to be there. But the problem is, as you guys know, we've talked about this. I don't really love Braun at the four with AD at the five. And it's not necessarily because I don't like Braun at the four. It's more so because I don't like AD at the five. So it's really, it's tricky, man. It's really tricky for me. I want a real center there, you know. I want a real center there, and I also want AD there, and I also want Braun there. So it's like you have to play Braun at the three if you're doing it the way I want to do it. And I think that gives you the most insurance for him defensively, the very most. Because at the end of the day, if if, if Anthony Davis is going to be preoccupied with guarding everything and he's getting pushed around by a true center for which he shouldn't be pushing around anyway, then it just makes for a more clogged paint, even if Braun's down there. It makes it for a, a more difficult situation for AD to try to manage that and all the physicality and all that it's just you need someone down there pushing on us those people uh for him and that makes him an even more sturdy defensive player and obviously then from there a more um you know spry offensive player so that's the trick to us is to try to figure out how do we get the most energy out of anthony davis knowing uh full well that we have issues trying to get that out of him. And my thing is, if he has responsibilities on the defensive end, that's probably the problem. You know, when you, what I'm trying to f- help myself understand, I guess, is what I'm trying to remind myself is more or less, Anthony Davis can very well play well getting 22 points and 10 rebounds because he's responsible for doing so much on the offensive rebounding situations, defensive uh, responsibilities and everything. And with the defensive responsibilities comes a responsibility to stay out of foul trouble, a responsibility to make up for other people's mistakes when things break down, and this is a lot of things to keep up with. So if his shot's not falling, he's still doing amazing stuff on the defensive end, even if it doesn't show up on the stats, and that is why I'm softer on AD than most, because I think, I believe I understand that he's playing well even when my eyes tell me he's not it's sort of like when Vanderbilt walks away with like two points and nine rebounds he did his job because he's responsible for stuff that you're not looking at you know what I mean it's like a you got to train your eye almost to try to understand what it is that AD does and then from there to understand that when he gives you 50 and 60 points that is absolutely phenomenal in and of itself given the fact that he's responsible for so much on the other side Now, I don't know how great he is when all of these things are put together and considered. But what I do know is any one human being who's responsible for that much of the basketball floor is likely going to be more injury prone than anyone else because of that. And so I wonder if... New Orleans leaning on him so much having these responsibilities and having so much offensive responsibility kind of just wore him down double time than anybody else making his 10 years more like 15 years 
And if so, that would explain why he's having trouble waking up for these games and playing with certain pace and all these different things. Because a lot of times, if what my theory is, he's a bit tired and just a bit worn down. And so these are just things I'm brainstorming. I'm just brainstorming these things. Because at the end of the day, Anthony Davis really does disappoint a lot of fans because of his effort level. But the effort level does not necessarily show you what it is that he's covering for you. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to understand. And then from there, I was going to try to segue to say, but the problem is he's dealing with players that he shouldn't have to deal with who are making him have to play more physical than he's probably supposed to be playing. And forcing LeBron James into the four spot forces him into those roles. So that's what I'm trying to help everybody understand. This is why I want us to put Winnie Gabriel next to Anthony Davis. This is why I want to put, um, you know, Mobamba when he gets back. And hopefully the Lakers can invest in a center who they can legitimately put next to this guy so that we never had this issue again. And then from there, LeBron James is going to have to go back to the three. You know what I mean? Because that's what it really comes down to. And so that's that's what I want. I don't think that is a ridiculous adjustment because I have always truly believed that LeBron James is a small forward to begin with. And so... I want him to try it. I want us to try lineups where LeBron James is at the three. <laughs> try lineups when LeBron James is at the one. Even though I don't I don't know if I really love that as it looks when he has to chase around small players. That's absolutely not what we want. But I'm just saying we got to try to slip him into other areas on the lineup so that he's not, you know, making it so that players who, are, who we have at the four spot are being forced off of the floor. You know, when our coach tells us that Rui Hachimura uh, is just the odd man out, I say to you, well, this is the solution here because we don't want size to be something that we extract from our game plan, especially when you're going up against that type of talent. Um, that's that's just that's an error. You definitely want Rui Hachimura's length and his weight on the floor to help with a guy like Patrick Williams, Vucevic, uh, you want him actually having to guard some of those guys in, in certain spurts because at the end of the day, he's a huge guy. And so that's, I mean, he's like, what, 6'10", 240 or something like that? It's a big man. And so you don't necessarily want to put him in situations where he's your weak side help, but you do want to have him facing up against certain guys uh, who otherwise LeBron James is being asked to face up with. So that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, can we get LeBron some help down there? I don't want to remove Rui because Bron's down there. I want to put him next to LeBron James because LeBron James can make Rui better. A lot of the things that Rui needs needs to come from guys who are passing him the rock. So why would we want to remove Rui from a situation where LeBron James can make him as a playmaker? I mean, make him as a as a scoring threat, playmaking off of him. So I, I just... I just understand that Darwin's looking for certain things, but uh, here's something that I think he needs to to take a look at as well. Because moving on from defensive options uh, and just kick and just punting the defensive side entirely, uh, I don't know that we're really that good of an offensive team to even do that. Like, I know we can score. We can score, score. But, like, when it really comes down to it, if that's going to be your strategy, you're not necessarily leaning into your strengths. This team actually has more defensive intangibles. And since we're the number one overall defensive team, would it not make sense for us to lean into our defensive schemes or our defensive uh, strengths, rather, uh, to 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 kind of help us win basketball games in this vein? Because I just don't look at us as a team that's going to be outscoring people. Not like that. Unless Anthony Davis goes up. And then Malik Beasley's hitting threes at the same time. We we're capable, but that's not you don't want to do you don't want to do that with Jack Zach Levine. You don't want to do that with DeMar DeRozan. They're gonna they're gonna outshoot you. And so that's that's what I think. Um they don't have to play out like that. Especially if you strategize a certain way. But 
you know, m more than more than not, that's probably how that's going to go. So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about Troy Brown and Max Christie combinations. That's what's been on my mind. I don't think we've seen it once, but that's that's just how that goes. But for me, I am absolutely certain. You put Anthony Davis, Max Christie, and Troy Brown on the floor at the same time. Put Austin Reeves down there, too. That's your four. And then maybe Vanderbilt or, or uh, Winyan Gabriel or LeBron James. But I'm thinking a defensive lineup, so I'm probably going to go with Winyan Gabriel or Vanderbilt. You give me that lineup, and we're, we're going to do some good things defensively for sure. They're going to do some very good things defensively. I'm just telling you right now. So, uh, you know, that offensive side, when it comes to Max Christie, uh, I think his confidence is where it needs to be. Last time we saw him, he, he, he went straight into a quick strike, mid-range jump shot that looked like a, a, a really, really, really polished player shot it. Went in, no problem. His three-point shot, I mean, do we have to go through this? Anybody watching me does not want to hear me go through this. I'm a big fan of Max Christie. His length is going to help us. Let's take a look at opportunities to slap him next to Troy Brown, whose length and his ability to play defense and get out and, and, and steal the ball. Because this, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the opportunities to take the ball from people. A guy like Zach Levine, if he has to deal with a double team like that, with Anthony Davis on the floor as well at the rim, trust you me, he's, he's, his efficiency is going down. It's going down. Troy Brown, Max Christie, and Anthony Davis, and Winyan Gabriel. You're going to get stops. Like, stop stops. I'm telling you. Whoever that fifth man is, it don't really matter. But those four, that four tandem, they're going to get stops, bro. You watch what I see. You watch what I tell you, rather. Because that, that's something I see in my head as clear as day. And this is just what they do. That's what those guys do. The length... And, and they're kind of thin. And you talk about Anthony Davis's length. You know, Vanderbilt, I want to I wanna believe him in that lineup. But I just don't know where he slots in, honestly. I just don't know where he slots in. It just depends on who's on the floor, the, on the offensive end. If I need him to guard a John Morant with that lineup, then maybe I'm putting him on the very best guy and putting Max and Troy on the third and, and, and second guy. You know what I mean? That Vando would be on the floor in those lineups. But th these these are the type of things I'm thinking about. Like, yo, I know we do politics here in terms of we must have the superstar win and all of that. But I'm telling you, if we're strategizing to actually get victories and beat the teams in front of us, these are the type of things we're really going to do. We're going to do these things. Because you know defense wins. Championships. you got to have your defense on point. And these, these lineups I'm talking about, they're not going to be bad offensively either. They're not going to be bad. You know what I mean? Especially if that ball handler is in place playing properly. If that's a, if that fifth person is LeBron James, if that fifth person is Austin Reeves, they're going to help with that a lot. If that fifth person is D'Angelo Russell, we got plenty of options. But I think we need to be leaning into the defensive end. I really do. I think we need to be leaning into the defensive end. And I think some of those people, the names I just said, are going to be the ones that are going to have to sacrifice in order for that to happen. And if we're serious about winning, that's exactly what we're going to let happen. I'm serious. Because I'm telling you, we keep doing this LeBron James, Anthony Davis front court thing. And we're going to be out of here in the first round, man. This ain't no joke. But there are ways around that. We got the roster to get around it. We just got to sacrifice like crazy and strategize properly for whatever it is that we see in front of us. And if it means we're extracting D'Angelo, if it means we're extracting Braun, if it means we're extracting anybody that ain't going to play no defense... Then that damn it, that's what that's what the Lakers got to do. That's that's what it takes to win. But what you can't do is that act like those options are not there, and then proceed to lose on on options that that are just lesser to what it is that we see, that we see this roster can do. This roster can do some things, but we just got to sacrifice. Big sacrifice. And so bringing Brown off the bench was a good idea idea in terms of walking toward that sacrifice but I don't like it as it pertains to the strategy because I don't think we're a better team for doing it for all it is that I understand you got to let the king be the king bro you slap him in that starting lineup and you let your team super duper star be seen as that and never less it's just a psychological thing man you don't ever bring the king off no damn bench 
Am I tripping? I don't think he makes us better off the bench anyway. He needs to be in that starting lineup <laughs> making people better and getting us off the easy starts with quick layups and stuff like that. We don't need him off the bench. He's an older guy, too. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just, I, that's blasphemous. I can't believe Darvin Ham actually did that. It had to be Bron's idea. Like, in my mind, that was Bron's idea. He, just, he wanted to sacrifice for the team. He wanted us to know he's willing to do that. And I'm telling you, no. <laughs> Thank you. But that uh, if you're willing to come off the bench, that's amazing. Because I can think of a lot of lineups I want on the floor. That's the thing. But that doesn't necessarily mean I think that makes us psychologically imposing anybody. If they think LeBron James coming off the bench, they know they can beat the Lakers. Put it like that. Because what does that tell you? That tells you the, the king is done. If he's coming off the bench, that tells you the king ain't got nothing left. I don't like what that says to anybody psychologically. Even if he's coming back from injury, I don't like it. It just speaks to our our team not being as strong as it actually supposed to be seen as. Because that dude is supposed to be a top five guy at all times. We don't want no psychological edges, especially when we have a few holes on our roster. No, 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 no. See, these are the type of things that play into you winning a championship. You got to have the edge at all times, even in the little stuff. Because the, the killers are watching Jamal Murray, watch it. John Morant, they watch it. I'm telling you, uh, Jason Tatum, all these guys. They got the Lakers and everybody, uh, they watching every team. All Every player is watching every team. And what I know is if they think you got some type of chink in your armor, if they think you're a little soft in any way, they're going to attack that. They're going to attack that. And so that's what I'm understanding. We're getting too close to playoff time to be doing little things like the little mistakes. And like I said, I feel like I'm a teacher out here. I feel like I'm teaching stuff that people have long forgotten about psychological edges as it pertains to making sure your strategy is hidden, making sure nobody knows what you're about to do, making sure you play to, into your own hands rather than against yourself. Like it seems like these, these principles are lost. And that's why everybody's just kind of mediocre because nobody really knows how to win. This, this is what I've been saying about this league right now. Food. 2022-2023. The entire league. I can think of so many champions that would have destroyed this, this league, man. 72 wins. 75 wins. Like, it would have been ridiculous. Shaq and Kobe. Mike and them. Heck, even some of the ones that didn't win the championships. I think about the Sacramento Kings of 2002. Do you know they would have won a championship on these guys? They didn't win the whole championship this year. San Antonio, all these teams I grew up on, they were smarter, man. They were just more intelligent than the entire league right now. Excluding nobody. Excluding absolutely nobody. Best team in the league right now would probably be a sixth seed in some of them years that I grew up watching. I am not exaggerating. It's just like the art of winning and the art of being competitive. It's like it's lost. People are fine with losing. Even listen to some people talk about it. They're like, oh, man, ain't that big a deal. Everybody loses. Like, nah, not me. I'm I'm beating all of y'all. Everybody loses because you lost to me. I'm of that mindset. Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, bro, we don't care about the rest of the field. Being fine with losing and everybody singing kumbaya with little goals, bro. I don't care about that. I want to win every game. And I feel like I can. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? When I look at these different strategies, I ain't seen nothing in this league that makes me say, yo, these guys can't be out strategized. It's essentially what I'm saying to you. Now, whether or not it can translate to me winning or not, that's up to athletes. But these strategies... Oh, man, they could be beat. They could be beat. They can be beat. So I, I just want to see more clock management taken more seriously around the league. They're all over the league. People need to learn how to win again. Far too many mistakes in the art of ending basketball games and killer instinct. It is absolutely ridiculous. Everybody wants to jack up a three. I'm telling you, if, if Nicholas Batum went 0 for 8, the Clippers would have lost by 30. It was the only difference. 
And this type of thing, I'm like, y'all gonna really try that in the playoffs? Is that is that how y'all gonna win? Maybe it works out. But for me, it's like I don't know who's gonna stumble their way onto the Larry O'Brien championship this year. Who's gonna stumble their way onto it? Which one of these teams gonna kind of be just good enough to beat the other losers to rise to the top? Like I literally look at this list. I'm I'm, tar- I'm sorry, everybody. I can't lie. Because if it was amazing, I'd tell you that too. If everybody was excellent and, and stellar and the whole league was doing things properly and everybody was filled with super talent up and down the roster and doing everything properly, I would tell you that's what I see. i tell you exactly what I see. I see, uh, I, th- I see about 30 teams in need of improving to some degree. That's what I see. And a couple of them are right on their way. I mean, they're right on their way. I look at OKC and Houston, some of the young teams, they're right on their way. Bucks, right on their way. A team like Phoenix making moves like that, they're not too far. It's not everybody's too far, but a lot of them are very far from being excellent. Like, excellent? Nah, we got a whole league full of people cool with not being excellent. And that's my problem. That's my problem. Nobody wants to go undefeated. Everybody's fine with um, low management. And that's fine. If you got to preserve yourself to your health, that's cool. But what about winning every game, though? I can't win every game if I ain't playing 82. That's how that's how I want to see it. I, I, and look, maybe that means reducing the games entirely. Maybe it don't need to be 82. Maybe it needs to be 62. I don't I don't have any answers. I don't have any answers. But there's something to be said for excellence. And the possibility of winning. Under any and other every circumstance. Somebody came back from 36. I think that's the record, ain't it? 36 is the, 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 the record for the largest comeback in NBA history, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody came back from that. So it, it's possible. And that's where I'm coming from. It's like, look, I don't want to hear nothing else about the Lakers having to be satisfied with losing. I don't want to see nothing else about the strategy of, of things not being good enough so that we can't properly compete these are things i don't want to see anymore if our if our talent is not able to beat the other team's talent cool fine but i am sick and tired of looking all over the league and seeing teams not have what they need you don't have a center you don't have a small forward you don't got a point guard like what are we doing minutes mentality all over the league and then just stuff that doesn't strategize properly to basketball it's like look i understand that basketball is a game that's played but it's also a game that's that's understood it's a strategy game just the same that's why i always reference basketball in a video game sense because even though i'm not playing the game it's still certain strategies that are to translate absolutely translate and so it's like that's why i'm I'm so arrogant as it pertains to certain strategy understandings because those things are not that's not separate i don't have to play the game to understand how people are supposed to be slotted on the on the basketball floor and the most basic things they need to be doing to put themselves in a position to look as if they can succeed. You know, I've, I've heard many people tell us we don't know the first thing about it, the first thing about it, but my eyes don't lie to me. They don't lie. You can't be too short out there, man, unless you're shooting really, 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 really good. You know, you got to be able to keep up with your man. You got to have the length to be able to contest your man. These are things that don't, you don't have a choice. This is not something you can betray and succeed. Many people do and they they they, they are fine with mediocre. That's why they have so many losses. Because they're all doing things that would not otherwise actually work. <laughs> People wonder why every team has like 30 losses. It's because they all do things that leave holes all over the floor. All of them. They all do things that give up victories. All of them. And I'm telling you, it's like, yo, I'm not of this mindset. All I see is a bunch of teams that I would beat. And then 
would be looking for higher talent to defeat. Literally. Where's MJ at? Where's Mike? Where's Kareem? Where's Larry? I want to go to a higher level. That's how I want to see my athletes compete. I want that type of confidence, bro. Like, none of these people are good enough. Where are the other guys? No, keep Larry O. Bring out the real competition. Because that's what Kobe was about. Like, hold on, you ain't got nobody better than this to beat? That's what Michael was about. That's what Kareem was on. This all you got? This ain't the finals. I'd have beat these dudes in the second round. Bring me somebody else. You understand what I'm saying? And that's the challenge I have for the entire league. Let's fix our problems. Get the bad contracts out of there. Get the dudes that can't play no more out of there. Develop players all over the league. Bring the G League dudes up that can jump from 50 feet away and put them on the floor and teach them fundamentals about how to win games. How to win. Not just how to make money. Not just how to do things that look funny and, and dancing and all this good stuff. How to actually succeed in the art, in the sport, in the science of basketball. And you will see this, that the level of talent that you're seeing right now and the overall balance of different teams and how they are, are, are able to play will be better. You will see better basketball. Same athletes, better basketball. Because certain things just leave guys at a disadvantage, I'm telling you. It don't even be about a guy being good or bad. Once you start to understand the game a little more, you start finding out you need more help on the floor for other certain things to kind of manifest and look good. And a lot of times we never even know this. We don't even have the context to even know these things as fans. And we just look at players and we listen to ESPN. They tell us a guy sucks and we say, yeah, that's it. And that'll be it. And then you start to dig in, and you're like, no, nah, that ain't it. And then you start looking at it with your own brain, if you're me, and you're like, no, nah, that really ain't it. My unique skull, I'm like, nah, none of this is right. I think everybody missing something to some degree, because it ain't even that difficult. Basketball ain't even that difficult. When you consider fouls and how much that plays into people being removed from the floor, just get people in foul, trouble, all game long and you're going to see the talent get easier and easier and easier depending on the depth of the team that's all I'm trying to do that's my whole scheme get Booker out the game because he can't kill me with 72 if he ain't out there if he's swiping and def trying to defend and they keep on whistling he getting mad he throwing his mouthpiece that's what I need I ain't trying to defend him I want him to defend himself by getting get himself out of the game by trying to defend somebody he can't defend and fouling them. This is strategy for real. I'm going to win. You understand what I'm saying? I don't care if that dude's better than me. I'm going to win. I'm getting him off the floor. I'm going to win. And so these are the type of things I'm thinking about. Like, look, I don't know where that competitive edge is. I don't know where it's going. You know, I look over at Charlotte. Michael's got his head to the ground. Like, that's the biggest competitor I've ever seen, him and Kobe. So it just seemed like everybody gone. Like, everybody's, like, the whole competitive spirit has just left the earth. And I'm like, no, we're going to bring that back. We're bringing that back. Ain't nobody happy with losing ever. I want to win every night because there's a chance to win every night. When I pay attention to these Lakers, do you know when I think we can lose? Rarely. If we implement the type of strategies that I actually believe in, I don't think most of these games we lose. Most of them. Maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe I'm just wrong. But I pay a lot of attention to this stuff, man. And I'm telling you, some of this stuff, we just be leaving opportunities on the board. And so I want to see return to confidence. A return to confidence. Not as it pertains to looking like you're big and bad, but actually actually playing like it because you've done the homework and the practice to put in the work to know that you've done it right. See, that's the difference. You put in that practice work. You ain't got to put big, bold, big, bad energy out there. You ain't got to do all that. The work gonna speak for itself. San Antonio showed me that. 
They had three words to say to anybody. Their game speak, speaks for it. You was going to deal with them. They was going to walk up the court like beating you was not a problem. It made you feel even worse. They weren't even all that happy about beating you. It wasn't, that, it wasn't a big deal. Where do you think I got this idea from? Bring on the other talent. This ain't that serious. I was watching Tim Duncan win championships with barely a smile on his face. I'm like, yo, I know what a champion look like. They're not impressed by much of anything. As soon as Larry, go, Larry O goes up in the air, the first thing they're thinking about after they finish celebrating is how are we going to go through the rigors of getting it again? And how much more tough it's going to be because everybody's looking at us to get it. Fun. That's why I'm like, man, I've been paying attention to champions all my life. I don't understand no damn fun. It's too much stress to be with. Like, what's fun? You're trying to pile up championships forever. What are we talking about fun? Pure and utter domination. What are we talking about fun? See, that's the, diff that's the difference between me and what I see. Pure and utter domination. As it pertains to this, I don't ever want to lose. Ever. Ever. 82-0 every year, no matter what. Maniacal in my winning. But I think that that breeds more understanding of how to win. Because when people are maniacal about winning, they discover sciences within the game to help them win. They discover things that help them win just because they're afraid to lose. So certain things they're going to just instinctually not do. And these are the things I'm talking about. It's like, yo, I need to find a maniacal winner who hates losing. So they'll be too scared to do some of the stuff that we see out there. That way, it won't happen. <laughs> Tell me. So that's what I crave as a fan. Find me another winner. I don't care. They don't have to be Kobe Bryant. Nobody's Kobe Bryant. But find me another winner. Somebody who desperately wants to put in the work. Then bring him here to L.A. to play for us. That's why I'm a, I'm a big fan of Austin Reeves because he looks like he's that kind of guy. He looks like he's that kind of guy. And so that's what I'm talking about, man. I, I will bring back this Mamba mentality every single day. I will bring you guys what true domination is and what I believe it to be. If it's maniacal, if it's crazy, if it's a bad energy, so be it. We win everything while everybody else is celebrating losses. I don't care because over here, we're going to be celebrating. So I gotta be parades every day. You know what I mean? Because if we're not playing to win, what are we doing? You want to celebrate losing? Why even try? A loss is when you don't compete. So if you want to lose, don't compete. But if you want to compete, play to win. Video forty-four. I thank you all for watching. I'm out.